Um, but it is time for us to move into the purpose of heaven through the ecclesia in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not just for personal advantage or even for the manifestation of the gifts of the spirit it is to bring the kingdom of god on earth even as it is in heaven for us to operate in the fullness and the power of the authority of the name of jesus so um, i'm feeling that in my own spirit uh, more and more and more um, and i feel like it's been one of those things that's been in plain sight and yet we've not laid hold of it to the degree i believe god's calling us to in this time and this season so dr don we are so welcome glad you're here and um, want you to uh, speak in to whatever is on your heart i know i sent out and posted on facebook and our advancing faith the dream and the blog post you had from a few weeks ago about Providence calling a conference. I, I was reading through it again this afternoon and I, I feel there's such a wind on it for this time and season. So welcome to uh, minister and speak what's on your heart and we can dialogue back and forth some and we'll see where we go. All right, excellent, Jackie and everyone, greetings. Uh, here in Jacksonville, and the uh, the dream, if I can jump into it quickly, Providence being God's involvement in history, uh, to put it really simply, uh, not one of those uh, polite words that uh, people often assume, it's one of those polite words to describe God, uh, it's rather uh, a fundamental statement, when you use the word Providence, you're making a very fundamental statement that God is not distant, but he is intimate, that he is involved uh, in history, but that he is accomplishing his purposes through empowered people. This is what ties Providence with Pentecost. I was thinking today of two very uh, distinct photo ops, I would call them snippets or a way of freeze framing uh, history. Revelation chapter 5, you see the Father seated on the throne, holding in his hand the scroll written uh, on both sides, so there's no room to write anything else. This is the eternal purposes of God. That's purpose. This is, this is what Father said, I want this. But he sealed it up with seven seals because he didn't have anybody who could do or produce what he produces purposes. That is the first fundamental thing that you should consider is if father wanted it why didn't he just do it <laughs> so in other words providence says to us god is involved but he's not going to accomplish it if god were going to do it it'd already be done so the father said here's what i want but i'm looking for somebody i'm looking for representative which uh was of course the lamb sacrificed before the foundation of the world Jesus who accepted responsibility, create what the Father wants, redeem what the Father wants. Now he is, is, he is restoring what the Father wants. And providence has become more important uh, to history uh, in, in, than ever before. So providence is not is something we talk about from the past. Providence is uh, the importance of the future. How involved in history is God? Well, it all depends upon his representatives. Uh, and so the way the father was representative, he uh, he sent his son because he couldn't be any better representative or more perfectly represented. Uh, and no one could have done what Jesus did. So everyone uh, in heaven was really happy because the father had looked around heaven and earth and under the earth and he couldn't find anybody who could get him what he wanted uh, until the lamb slain uh, was revealed and with his earned authority, uh, he was celebrated and he was worthy because of what he has done he is worthy of all power and glory and authority and riches and wisdom. And... But then the second, that, take that picture and then beside it, put the picture of Jesus saying to his disciples, to the originating apostles, um, the best thing I can do is leave. This is at the end of his ministry, nearing the end of his life. And so here's the rep perfect representative of the father who's come to get the father what he wants. And he says to his apostles who are looking at him, and he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be out of here. I'm dying. Uh, then I'll be resurrected. But, uh, 
you know, I'm going. In fact, John 13, before he picks up the towel in the basin, it says, Jesus, knowing that he came from God and is going back to God, <laughs> then you fill in the blank. What's he going to do next on that basis? Well, that's when he washes feet, which tells us something very, very important about the thinking of Jesus. Because if Jesus said to me, I'm, you know, if he were here and he said, hey, the best thing I can do is leave, I would say, wait a minute, we, have, we need to talk. Seems to me like the best thing could happen is if you stay, uh, we've already seen you uh, do what you do, and we've heard you say what you say, and uh, you're the perfect representation, uh, representation of the Father. No, we don't think you need to go. But he said, no, this is the best thing for me to leave because my Father will send Holy Spirit. So what we understand is that if Jesus was going to do it, it'd already be done. But he has a strategy straight from the Father that as the Father was represented by Jesus, Jesus would be represented by him. And that's why I say when you talk about providence, you're discussing God's involvement with a remnant. And that's what I saw in this dream. And it was so powerfully impacting to me that God wants everybody, but he never starts with everybody. He always starts with a remnant and he puts in the remnant what he wants everybody else to have. So this three-part dream was a conference with Holy Spirit. Uh, the second part was uh, our good uh, friend, Jackie Tyre, sliding out of her chair onto the floor under the power of the glory of God. How beautiful is that? And uh, thirdly, it was strong emphasis uh, about what those first two things mean in terms of the, the operation or the function of the remnant in our nation right now. And in the world, every fathering nation and every, every nation on earth where there is a remnant, I believe what's happening today and will culminate on the day of Pentecost is global. God is doing something global right now because this pandemic's global. It's affecting the global economy. And I think that every remnant person in the earth will be affected by the day of Pentecost. And it is an historic time as the Passover was historic and uh, the events that took place, God has made these moments historic as we enter the roaring twenties and I believe the greatest decade of history. So I would like to address those three aspects of the dream, um, Jackie, and um, it's okay if I call you Jackie or I'll... Oh, absolutely, please. I, um, I mean that with all respect. So I, um, I thought what was first of all singular was that when the conference was called, there uh, there was no platform and no worship team, uh, because providence came into the room, and um, when providence came into the room, the remnant was the source of all the messaging. Uh, it was kind of the opposite when God calls a conference, uh, the message and representation. Um, and this is not a polemic. It's not like God was saying, I hate conferences and I don't want anybody on the platform and I don't like worship teams. It wasn't that way at all. This is a dream. And in the dream, he is saying that I need my remnant to get on the same page with me because representation is what is so critical in this moment. So when Jesus said to his disciples, uh, you're going to go, you know, get out of here and go represent me. The first thing he said was, wait, don't go until you can re represent me properly. So I believe that God has been calling us to a more pure representation and the messaging. For example, one thing that he said um, to me in the dream, a mild rebuke, Jesus came right up beside me. If there is such a thing as a mild rebuke. Uh, in the dream, I shared something with people seated in front of us. Some, I just leaned up and was like, ram, 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 you know. And uh, providence stood by my side in the form of Jesus. Uh, that means that uh, Jesus was made a personal intervention. It was kind of like tap me. It's like gone. I didn't ask you to share your own stuff because what I was doing was speaking some of my messaging, which is good. What I mean by that is that as you preach Sunday and as I preach and as I minister. We have revelation, and God's happy with that. He wasn't rebuking me for that. He wasn't saying, I don't want you to share the stuff I've been giving you. What he said when he stood beside me was, 
that it's good stuff. Your stuff's good stuff, but we're doing something specific about leading as a remnant. And I felt like God was, you know, in the dream, he was hammering home the idea that our messaging has to represent in the sense that we need one message, that our message in all of its, com you know, component parts becomes one message. The remnant cannot be sharing, you know, this is not a time for the, for the remnant to have dialogue or discourse uh, to come to conclusions. We better have come to some concrete conclusions right now so that when we speak in this time, we represent Jesus. You know, Jesus, of course, taught us this, as you know, so well. He said, I represent the Father, so I don't say anything I want to say, and I don't do anything I want to do. I only say what I hear him saying, and I only do what I see him doing. And that's kind of the completeness of, or the ultimate, or the maturing, or the, the moment of of impact and influence for this remnant at this moment is that we need to shut down in terms of our message to the world, uh, the influence in this culture, but more importantly, our message to the principalities um, because of what Ephesians 3.10 says that through the ecclesia, we inform the rulers in the heavenlies. We, we tell them, hey guys, this is about what's about, about to happen. And again, if Father was going to do that, it'd already be done. If Jesus were going to inform them, it'd already be done. But he's not. He's informing them through us. So there's coming this critical mass moment that we're in, in which the power of Holy Spirit is going to be upon us saying what Jesus is saying and empowering us to do what Jesus is doing right now. Yeah, Don, I think that is really critical. And one of the reasons I started with how in the last couple of weeks, I'm hearing more and more people talk about the top of the mulberry trees and right. the angels rushing, um, because I had not heard that from other places mm -hmm. when I began looking at this back, what, late March or so. Um, and the Lord had a context in which he spoke that to me because of history that I'd walked with, with the Lord, but it's such an encouragement when you begin to hear the same message coming in different ways, different yeah. aspects of it, different understanding, enhanced understandings, but there's a sound coming out of the ecclesia right now. And I'm just using that as a one example. I mean, we could go over and over and over in so many places where there's a consistent sound coming out of right. a remnant people. Right. Of course, he, he had already been, as you said, he'd already been in the Valley of Giants. And um, if we were to talk about the Valley of Giants um, in this, this is where the giants are. This is where they live. This is where they worked out. This is where they held court, so to speak. This is where their statues of them were. This is like the Hall of Fame of Giants and the hangout of Giants. It was the sacred place of, of the most powerful of David's and, and Israel's uh, enemies. And they'd already come in and run them out. They, they, you know, David was good at cleaning up valleys. And so he cleaned up the Valley of Giants. And then it says that they, their idols, they burned their idols. In other words, they, they, they just, cleaned house. I mean, they cleaned out the valley, and yet the battle wasn't finished. And so what they did the first time, however, was what produced the second time, seems to me. But in that moment, here's David, greatest general of his day, of his generation, and the mighty men. I mean, you know, you would, you would think this is contrary to what I just shared. It's like, well, God was going to do it. It already be done. And yet, to me, what we're talking about reinforces that point because, and the day of Pentecost does as well, because essentially what God said was, you have hit them head on and I want you now to step back. I want you to, I want you to position yourself so that the next thing that happens, what we call waiting on the Lord. And when people say, well, what do you mean to wait on the Lord? I said, well, you wait on the Lord because the next thing that happens is what he does, not you. That's why you're waiting. And so he hears the sound, which is marching, the Hebrew, it's marching. He hears the marching of feet. The angelic army is on the move. And then he knows uh, that now's the time. 
now's the time for me to respond because I've been synchronized. I'm synchronized with God. So to me, it says, I've synchronized my mouth, so I'm saying what he's saying. I'm synchronizing my action because I'm doing what he's doing. And it's like in Brownsville, you know, we used to sing, um, we will ride with him. You know, he's, he's on a white horse. And I, was, and I preached this in, in Brazil a lot. I was like, you know, we used to sing, we, he's coming on a white horse. And then I said, you know, if Jesus got a horse, I need a horse too. You know, in other words, whatever he's doing, that's what I need to be doing. If he's walking, I'm walking. If he's running, I'm running. Well, he's got a white horse, I need a horse. So that, you know, and we said, we will ride with you. That was, to me, it always prophesied the idea, I'm doing what Jesus is doing. I think that the revelation of what Jesus is doing is not available to everyone. Now, it's not elitism when we say that. This is a strategy of God throughout the history of the book, throughout the history of, of the world, that God has always worked through a strategic remnant to accomplish what he was going to accomplish. And this goes back uh, to glory, to the second part of the dream, and why uh, Jackie was sliding down of the seat because she couldn't just sit she couldn't sit there anymore it was the weight of glory had come upon her what we call overshadowing glory and <clears throat> this is not the same as falling out um you know under the power this is um overshadowing glory is different and i experienced uh anointing and i've experienced power and endowment and i've experienced other ways in which the power of god manifests but Overshadowing glory is just being so overwhelmed by God that the only strength that you will have while you're in overshadowing glory will be his strength. It's that it's the same concept of David, you're not ready to go until I'm going with you. It's the same idea Moses had when he said to God, I'm not going anywhere if you're not going with me. And so it's that it's that understanding of representation that comes to an ultimate moment to, to reach the remnant reaches a point of representation. And this is really all of us are studying Ecclesia. This is really what Ecclesia is all about. It's, it's that moment of representation that rises to the place where what we say is what God's already saying in heaven. And that's kingdom keys. And I, uh, I think that we've been moving toward this moment of kingdom reset that's coming in uh, at Pentecost will mark that moment in that we've heard about a lot of things now we're going to experience we're going to live those things how would you say you see that looking practically when say we gather um in a way that we're moving correct correctly with with the Lord and what he is doing you would, your group of people there at, um, in Atlanta would have to do something completely out of character to miss it because you already do everything that's necessary as David did in the first time in the valley. In other words, you're already doing what's doing. And as soon as God comes in overshadowing glory, you're, you're primed. You're already prioritized. You're already synchronized. Mm -hmm. You'll just respond to that, and uh, it won't. It'll be new and different in that way because what God's doing is a different kind of manifestation. But to you on the other side of it, it'll see. Uh, you'll see like it'll be as if this is the way you've always lived because it's so natural for you to bend before Him, to yield, to surrender, to submit. To these are the things that sessions like this have been training us for. These are the these are the very reasons we've been given leaders like you and fathering leaders um, that have spoken and, and, and the kind of leadership that's come from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and through the, the 2000s up to the, up to the 2020s. We've been primed for this. I, it will seem so natural to us. In Brazil, when I experienced this, and I've been to Brownsville, and, and, and you know, Jackie, you and I have been in situations where we experience the glory of God in ways that were just, you know, overwhelming. But when I was in Brazil, which I think they're probably ahead of us in this in this form of awakening within the church uh, or their readiness to receive overshadowing glory, um, 
in those sessions, the things that I've seen and experienced, that's the way it felt. It was like, I'm ready. I was born for this. And I finally found what I was born for. When the when when glory comes and things just you know happen, I, you know that that are so obviously God. You know, I remember you know just stretching out my hand. They overshadowed glory. Came in three thousand people there, and, and I stretched out my hand and and I watched. It looked like a crop circle, where you know people just fell out in a circle, mm. and you know their bodies just went like that. And I looked back and then, you know it looked like a crop circle of bodies just fell in a circle. I was like, how? <laughs> Nobody could make that happen. No catchers, just bodies everywhere, completely. People have just gone in the power of God. And then, you know, that happened all over the room where crop circles of people just fell out. It was as if a shaft of glory came down and anybody in the shaft uh, could no longer function by physical means. They had to function by spiritual means. And then the people on the floor if there was something demonic in their life, it manifested. If there was something physical needed healing, they were restored. And, and then other types of manifestations that you and I have seen, manifestations of glory, just occurred. They just happened. And you look at them and you have wonder about it like a child. But on the other hand, you feel like this is what I was born for. This is normal for my life. Of course, what also happens is once you've experienced that, you're ruined forever. And you can never feel like you're where you need to be in, until you are in that atmosphere again. When you were sliding down, that's a different thing. And, I, and it's a different, it takes us into the second part of the dream. But, but that, which speaks to how we end up with one message and we end up doing things in oneness. But, um, that's the only way I know to describe it. I mean, I could talk about actual manifestations, but in the dream, you know, Jesus says something very important. He says, uh, you know, my people are always after my presence, uh, but they don't realize um, that my presence comes for a purpose. So that right there what, is so key yeah. because we, we have been trained, um, even like I was talking this past Sunday, we've been trained on what to expect with Pentecost. Yes. And it's been self in a lot of ways, how it right. benefits me, which yeah. there's a, there's a reality and a goodness to that. Yeah. That's God's love poured out to us, but yeah. we stopped there rather than looking beyond into what is, what is God's purpose? And he stated it from Genesis one he stated it through Mo Abraham and Moses and David and Jesus and the upper room. And it's consistent all the way through. There's no inconsistency of what he wanted. He wants a representational people on the earth that will move with him and do what he's doing and say what he's saying and accomplish bringing his kingdom into the earth. But that whole aspect of uh, what, learning in maturity how to discern his presence and what not just to discern that he's come but for what purpose has he come in this moment that's right so when um in the dream when you were sliding uh in the chair i um stepped up to you and shared something that i had in the dream that I shared something that i have uh, experienced and released to tens of thousands of people in brazil and because a vision, an experience I had with God where Jesus shared an experience with me was the, that's what I experienced in the vision. So what I received in the vision that sent me there is what I release uh, when I'm there. And I haven't done that very much in, other, in the United States. I have in other nations. But you were overwhelmed by the glory. And she represents the highest leader Integrity of involved intercession, those with purpose in mind, more than using presence, but fulfilling the purpose presence reveals. So in the, and those are, these are intentional words I'm choosing because these are coming right out of the communication of the dream, not out of me, although I understand them because of my experience. So I laid hands on her and prophesied something I had learned from experience in Brazil. 
and she <gasps> took in the breath. Mm. And of course, I've, I've had an experience in which the, God sent an angel with his breath. And, uh, you know, he blew, he blew his breath into an angel. The angel turned and came to me and put his mouth on my mouth and blew the breath of God into me. And so that's what I was doing. I didn't put my mouth on your mouth in the dream. I laid hands on you and you experienced what I experienced in that. Now, what that is and what makes all the difference, if you want to produce purpose in presence, you have to begin with passion. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus has is the passion of the Father. When I saw him in the vision that took me to Brazil in the March the 7th, 2003, I saw the fire in his eyes and I realized that fire was coming from his belly, not from his own heart, it's not from his own mind, but from his belly, like an impartation that comes to us, comes to our spirit, not to our heart. And I realized that the passion that I saw in his eyes, the burning fire was it was passion, but it was not the, the passion of Jesus. And so you, in this representation of intercession, of remnant intercession and remnant leadership in the dream, I breathed on you and you <gasps> took in the breath of God and it was fire when it went inside of you. It was God's passion. You were breathing the breath of God and motivated by his passion. Now, when you have the passion of the Father and his presence manifests, remember, he's, he's already there. You know, Jesus said in the dream, uh, people keep looking for me to show up. He said, I don't have to show up. I'm already there. What happens is I manifest. And when mm -hmm. I manifest, I'm also pointing you to a purpose. Why am I manifesting? I'm only manifesting some aspect of my character, not the totality of God. Because I'm manifesting, my presence is manifesting something you need to become, not just have. Mm -hmm. Pentecost is not just receiving, even though you're endued with power, but something you need to become, the representative of me, that what you say and do represents me. And so only by representing Jesus can we produce his purpose. If I receive Pentecost for my own purposes, mm -hmm. I'm empowered to do something I want, but that's not the living sacrifice life. That's not the purpose of Pentecost. But the thing that happened with Jesus was that he never operates in his own passion. And that God has been separating us from other fire. The strange fire is as fire that you kindle yourself. Mm -hmm. Fire in the tabernacle and temple came, God's presence came in and he lit the fire. So it was God's fire. So Nadab and Abihu got in big trouble because they kindled their own fire. That strange fire is fire that I make. It's passion right. I have. If there's anything in me that's motivated to use the power of God to produce something I want, that's witchcraft. I'm appropriating spiritual power to produce what I want. The remnant has to be so pure that they only desire what God wants and use the power they receive to produce that. So his fire comes to purify so that our passion is dead. We need to just be so dead that we are motivated by what motivates the Father. And that I saw that in the dream. I knew exactly what I was seeing in the dream when I prayed for you. You were overwhelmed in the glory, representing the kind of remnant leader who now is motivated by the passion of God. And I'm not saying you weren't before, you right. understand. But I'm saying that what Jesus is emphasizing for us is a purity of passion, and if we have that, um, we'll be a part of the remnant of, inside the remnant, and uh, that's the next thing he he mentioned. Oh, hold on. I had something I was going to... This reminds me of Ezekiel 2. I mean, every time when I read it, and then when you began speaking, in Ezekiel 2, 1, it says, and then he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet, because Ezekiel was had fall, gone out on his off of his feet. Yeah. He said, "Stand on your feet, that I may speak with you." And he spoke to me, 
the spirit entered me and set me on my feet and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said, son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel. He gave him his commissioning, but there was this overwhelming encounter with the glory that happened for Ezekiel. Then God says, come stand up and he breathes into him. And what's interesting for me, and this is just a little side note here, is this was one of the primary passages the Lord used to call me into ministry. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's a very significant reason for this. And it has to do with intercession because as you continue this passage, it goes into chapter three, which is all about watchman intercession. Exactly. So it, it right. totally fits even for the assignment of this ministry mm -hmm. as watchman, intercession, prophetic, you know, see the kingdom of God advance, do the work, move with what he's doing. And one of the phrases that I have prayed for probably close to 30 years has been that we would move in the spirit of God in purity, passion, and power. Yes. It has to be all three. It can't be any segment of it. It has to be the fullness of all three. Well, that's true. Well, see how God, we really are born for this moment. Yeah, it's we really we are. are. We can, I mean, we can't, when, when a greater fullness comes, that's what we feel. We feel that understanding. This is what I, I'm, I was born for. This is why I'm alive. This is, this is the glorious thing that I embrace as if I've always known it, mm -hmm. and yet it's new. But it, it's like an instantaneous introduction uh, to an aspect of my destiny that I didn't know. And uh, there was a we know a person whose name is destiny and they were in the conference and um there was an aspect of that and i think that's what we're speaking to is that when we come into these moments we will rehearse our past and have a revelation of our past we never had before Absolutely. we'll say oh now i understand that now i understand this now i understand the providential pathway through which god walked me always with me anticipating this moment preparing me in the sense that his involvement in my life brought people in and experiences into my life that they tested me they formed me they shaped me uh, they revealed my levels of passion and um, and brought me to this moment ready to respond with boldness that we won't come to this time of pentecost and and what i think will be the greatest battle that we have, any of us have known in terms of spiritual warfare uh, coming this, in the remainder of this year, 2020, we're coming into the battle, not coming out of it, mm -hmm. that we will, we will look back with boldness. We won't come to this moment and say, ah, I'm not ready. We'll come to this moment and say, I have my obedience and my submission, though imperfect, um, has taught me how to to move in this moment. I'm ready. I'm so dead that I don't fear death. I'm so passionate that nothing stops me from speaking what I hear him saying, not my opinion, not my religious doctrine, but the message I'm speaking. And when I speak it, I hear this echo in the heart of everyone else in the remnant. Like the 300 of Gideon, um, everybody did the same thing at the same time and that's what brought consternation to the enemy and the the small group of people were able to turn the terror of the army you know the terror that came when the army marched in turned the terror back upon them and uh, the enemy started killing themselves i mean it was it was god showing uh showing up in a really powerful way uh, through that remnant, which is exactly what I think is about to happen. I think that's where we are as this nation, and I'm sure true in other nations as well, but with our a lot of our focused intercession here for the United States and for the remainder of the year, how critical that is that we not pray our agenda, but we have the agenda of heaven. We have yes. what is the Father doing and move with him. Yes. And I know, Don, Dr. Don, you've heard um, some of the, the dreams and different things that uh, Apostle Clay and Dutch and some others have, and the whole context of coming out of Valley Forge 
and the Ecclesia army rising in the month of June past Pentecost in a way we've never uh, been together before and how the army in the Revolutionary War went into Valley Forge rather, you know, tattered and disorganized and kind of thrown together, yeah. suffered a uh, disease, suffered cold, suffered not having enough yes. food, not enough anything. And yet God sent in the resources to train and equip in the midst of their challenges and struggles and difficulties and yes. coming out came as a mighty army with strategies to win and they went forward and had a major major victory in june and here we are and it's almost like god saying okay i really want you here in this country in the united states i want you to see you are moving in a synchronization with a foundation of what has been and now moving it into the spirit realm as the ecclesia with greater understanding greater strategy greater oneness not among the everyone but among the remnant and yeah. that our assignment is pave the way yes. so that the others can come in quickly and we're going to yeah. i think we're going to see there's going to be aspects in which we are doing this even like we've got we've started gathering again and i was able to say to a group of pastors of larger congregations today because they're still wrestling through how do you do this i said i'm grateful we're small because no. it's not as complicated there's not as much to figure out and maneuver but i said mm -hmm. i also know that we're doing it as an intercessory company for yes. the breaking open of the rest it's right. not about us we are able to god says this is your assignment break mm -hmm. it open for everybody else and I think that's where we are as an ecclesia, as a remnant warrior company of people, not just here, but across the nation. There's a remnant warrior company of people yes. that are sold out with purity, passion, and power to do the bidding of the captain of the Lord's host, not our own bidding. Absolutely. I, I believe that's absolutely true. Um, even in the dream, then, God seem to point me to a remnant within the remnant. And I don't think that means they're more of a remnant. I think they're more strategic. And that's what you're pointing to. That even within the remnant, there's a strategic remnant. They're the pace setters. They're the originators or the fathers, the ones that originate, or as we say, the pioneers, uh, which definitely is you and the ministry that you lead, the people who are listening to me now, is that you continue in a pioneering spirit. I have here, uh, here in my uh, in my office, a machete, brand new machete. Uh, I was at a conference before the pandemic, and uh, we, as we began the conference, an intercessor brought me this machete and said, "God told me to buy this and give this to you because you're a pioneer and you're going to be cutting." through um, the, the uh, undergrowth, the overgrowth of, that's covered up the pioneering, the, the actual pathway. So we've been doing that. We've been uncovered, we've been re-pioneering some things that were already pioneered. And I think that because of that, um, both Providence leading us to do so, but us making those efforts and, and, and finishing things is, is, is really important finishing things that we're ready for this moment. Gideon's group, you recall, uh, God said, uh, have them go down and get a drink, you know. I thought, you know, is this how you're gonna test us? Is, uh, you know, some simple thing, catch us off guard, so to speak, or in the mundane of life, you're gonna determine who's ready uh, to be the remnant of the remnant. And uh, it appears to me what happened was that the guys uh, who just, went face down in the water and drank, went home. But the others knelt down and lapped the water up so they could remain alert, completely aware of what was going on. Uh, and uh, But only 300. Wow. Um, so you see, there was in them an awareness. You could say they were awakened, that they, or you could say they just, um, you know, what was natural to them was what God needed in this moment. 
And maybe that's the better way that there's a remnant within the remnant that the way we function is exactly what God needs to represent the moment. So later the 30,000 joined in, but the 300 um, did something the 30,000 could never do. And again, remember it was God said, I can't use 30,000 because if they win, they'll say, look what we did. They weren't dead enough. So there is that, that aspect of it. But in, in the United States of America, uh, you know, the remnant could be 3 million. That'd still be a remnant. Uh, and I don't think that the remnant is only 300, and I don't think it's 30. Uh, I don't think it's just 30,000. I think it's larger than that. But we saw something, and I, I think the time I, I saw it best in the United States was in uh, Chattanooga with Dutch um, for me, because what I felt in the nations, I felt there. It came on me. The passion of God came on me. And even on the platform, I, I just finally, I just had to leave the platform. I was, I was so overwhelmed by passion. I was so burning because I looked out and I thought, this might be one of the few times in my life I've seen an authentic ecclesia function. And at that moment, I knew kingdom keys had been inserted and things had happened. I've seen that happen with 10 people, as you and I both have, mm -hmm. on a strategic assignment. And you knew the key went in and unlocked something. I've seen it with 20 and 30,000 in Brazil. I saw it there, and I don't know how many were there, probably 3,000, I would estimate, maybe less. But something happened there where I, I saw that with one voice, we were doing the same thing together in such a way that the key inserted and the lock turned. We, we either locked some things and unlocked some things, but probably both. And I knew that the purpose of that moment, the purpose of that gathering was not about what had been said from the platform, it's what was some being said and the worship emanating from each person in the seats. And so I think we are pleased and, and it's wonderful, for example, that you're having Dutch and Tim, you know, mm -hmm. probably the general with the most passion and then uh, the guy's so passionate about the angelic host that he, he has been able to identify hundreds of different angels. Um, and you got to have a lot of passion to get that interested in the subject where you, you stick with it to that level. And yet those are the guys coming to Atlanta, the distribution center, the place I think that is a critical mass and will be in the next election, critical mass in so many different ways. First fruits and pioneering, even now with the pandemic, things happening between our states, among our states that have been trend setting. Um, look out, you know, Pentecost is going to be an explosion, uh, unlike anything else. And then June, uh, we are going to see the outbursts. We're going to see Gideon 300s uh, breaking pitchers and blowing trumpets and and raising torches. Um, and I believe we're going to see a turning in of terror uh, among the enemy and the Leviathan system in a powerful way during this season. That's good, Dr. Don. I think the timing of this conference um, that we're doing in June, mm -hmm. um, I mean, God so orchestrated it. <laughs> you yeah. know, I just kind of, I listen, I follow, I, I allow things to kind of fall into place. And yeah. Um, to see that we're doing this within a couple of weeks after Pentecost, and it will be very near the timing of that battle uh, coming out of Valley Forge. Right. And I need to look that up because as you were speaking, I'm thinking I need to get that exact date because we're going to be right within the week of mm -hmm. that battle. And so I think it's very key uh, with yes. words over Georgia and the key the keys that are said that we have and that we have to contend over in order to shift and go in the direction. And uh, one of the words Chuck had was that we would be a model for the yeah. nation. And I'm really pondering and praying wow. over that. Of what does that look like? Yeah. How, how do we get there? What, do, what are you requiring of us today in order to move into what will be the model for for the future so and model speaks to representation good give us some yeah, well, model speaks to representation so 
Um, I was on the phone uh, today with a spiritual son in what we say Tanzania. And just, you know, since I've known him, God's broken him open, put him into a place of uh, national and international leadership influence, parliament, members of parliament coming to him. Um, and he will address the nation on their largest television program to bring the national address for their Thanksgiving day as the president called the nation to fast and pray for three days. Wow. And he'll address the nation as a very young man. And I was prophesying to him today that God is causing you to produce a model and be bold. Don't step back, be bold. If, if you were born for this, then do that. Be like David in that moment that uh, the mold has not been set by King Saul. Uh, the, the mold has been caught in, in the valley of, you know, the barren lion, right? It's, um, and so that's what represented. You know, God said of David, I found David, which means he was looking for David. And I'm coming to a really important point that I definitely wanted to make tonight. I found David, that means he was looking for him, and he said he has my passion, he has my heart, that's what it means to have the passion of God. And then after you've already read that stack of books about what it means to have the heart of David or the heart of God, uh, you can find out very simply what that is. He said he has my heart, he will finish everything I've asked him to do. And what I'm impressed about in terms of the remnant right now is the remnant, like David, going into the valley the second time, it already burnt the idols. I mean, most of us think, oh, we burnt the idols. Woo, we go home. God said, go back, do a finishing work. So I think we're coming into a season of ultimates. In other words, I think some of the things we've looked for are coming into their peak moments, to the heightened moments, when things that we have been working on for maybe all of our lives, but at least for several years, years are going to come to their highest point they're going to rise to a, a level we hadn't seen them rise and that within itself will identify the remnant god will have put into us as models what he wants everybody else to have mm -hmm. that will be the great shift that's the reformation beginning the reformation begins because people look at, at the model that god reveals and says oh that's the norm that's the new normal because god's defining the new normal not man i am convinced that we are those kind of leaders i don't know if you and i will be that you know i don't know what what that looks like um, you know uh, fame and fortune means nothing to me what means something to me is the thing that god told me when i was a teenager would happen and i my eyes would see it my ears would hear it that this nation would experience awakening again. That's what I want. Yeah. And um, in the midst of all this going on in my life and around me, this pandemic, what's happening personally, my passion keeps me focused on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think that I have been born for this and there's a place in the remnant. I'm going to act as if I am. Yeah, I believe there's a number of leaders. I mean, I've heard your story about when you were a teenager, my call with the whole yes. vision and the dropping of the letters of revival over my head when I was 18. Yes. Yes. I've heard similar things out of uh, a number of national, international leaders that I don't even, you know, look to count myself in that mix, but right. I hear it um, of encounters and dreams, visions, uh, things that we at that point in time didn't really understand but right. we knew we were marked for right and i can see how that is moving among so many right now um and as we get ready to kind of close out this segment of being live do you have anything you would want to just close out with you i'm not putting a time limit on it just that you want to release uh, out into the atmosphere uh, that can be over us or just out into those that will watch it today or afterwards, because I want us to be really pointed in our pursuit and passion for moving forward into what's coming. Yeah, I feel as if passion will produce boldness. 
-hmm. And the thing about Jesus, he never felt as if he was overstepping his role by saying what he heard the father say. If you can hear the father say it, be bold. Don't prophesy about something right now. Prophesy something. Don't pray about something. Decree something. Boldness is the moment we're in. And when we hear those angelic armies marching, that should increase our boldness, and we should be bold. If you see Father doing it, get it done. If you've been waiting for the moment, recognize the moment when it arrives. Because we're going to say some things we've been prepared to say for 30 years and do some things we've been thinking about doing, but known that it wasn't time. Right. We're going to birth some things we've been carrying about uh, very uncomfortably for many years. We were born for this, but boldness is what is necessary. The groan of God coming in us is what produces the birthing. And as Jesus approached the Lazarus tomb, twice he stopped and he, he groaned. And, and the, the Greek word is like a horse blowing. And that's a very loud, very it was something in him because he was pregnant with with resurrection that he was birthing the resurrection of Lazarus that kind of experience is going to come upon us as we breathe in his breath and we speak out what we hear him saying and then we do what he's showing us to do so that we have a model of a finished work we have something that the world would say okay uh, or other ministries who are looking for this will say, wow, I can be bold as well, because they'll step forward and say, I'm now convinced. I know this is the direction we should head. So I pray that that passion that's already in you, that you would stir up, you would blow on the coals, stir the coals, the living coals, the burning um, heat, the the fire that's in you, stir it up, let it blaze, let it consume, let it overtake you, let there be uh, an anticipation in you now as we approach the end of the month of permission, May being the month of permission, that we come out of May with permission from the Father that makes us bold as lions as we come into June for the season of battle. Amen, that's good. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to sign us off on the live stream. So I'll hang on. Thank you all for joining us online. Uh, obviously, if you would like to, and I've forgotten to do this the last two weeks, so I'm going to do it tonight. If you would like to sew in to what we are doing here, uh, just go to the donate page on our website. We want to bless these uh, men and women that have uh, joined us to come in and speak life into us during this time and this season. It's very strategic and very important for us all. I bless you and let us know if we can do anything to serve you. Hope you will join us on live streaming again soon. God bless.